So welcome to the final instalment of our epic wild boar hunting trip to Hungary. So, whilst the trip itself was pretty epic, unfortunately the hunting at the end of it wasn't so much. A little disappointing. But we'll come on to that in a minute. But what it was is an exciting journey to get there. Not only did we have a huge amount of fun at WMS Firearms Training at Andrew Venables, we got to select some really cool equipment and then we had that epic road trip across Europe, so all great fun. It was. It was good fun stopping where we stopped, exactly. seeing the gun shops, the Blaser Factory, which was absolutely epic for me. So first things first, we started with learning how to shoot driven or moving game. Now here in the UK, we're all taught from right from the beginning, say deer must be standing broadside, must give you a shot and take a nice ethical, humane shot in the engine room. Yeah. Whereas actually when you're over in Europe and you're shooting driven game or game that's walking, then it's a completely different style of dynamic shooting. So going somewhere like WMS Firearms Training with a guy who knows as much as he does like Andrew, it, it was uh, pretty interesting. We first started off out on the range shooting freehand, first year at 100, so yeah. shooting freehand, cycling quickly, target acquisition. Using small calibre rifles as well, yes. 2.2s, 1.7s, things like that on the steel targets, just to get yourself used to doing it, because it's unnatural. Everybody uses bipods or they use sticks, and nobody really takes a 100-yard freehand shot, do they? No. Because you don't have to, you don't want to. But being out there and doing the training, not only we're taking it at 100 yards, we're using our own rifles with a red dot reflex sight all the way back at 200 yards. Yeah. So when you're hitting a, an 8 to 10-inch disc consistently at that sort of distance freehand, it really does give you confidence. Confidence in yourself, your ability, the equipment, and when it does come down to it, you know you can take the shot. Yeah, you feel comfortable taking the shot. So from there we moved on to the real fun bit of the day, which was Andrew's driven target, so a moving wild boar. Yeah. And that's where things started to really hot up, because you put into practice all of your technique, how to hold the rifle, how to mount, how to address the target, and then the thing is moving. And making sure that you can pick just that right point of lead to consistently hit in the kill zone, it's, um, it's yeah. a challenge. It's good though, it was really good fun and putting everything that we learnt on that day into that last little bit was really good and you appreciate what Andrew's knowledge and what he taught us. It was an epic day, wasn't it? Yeah, it takes the things that we already know in terms of good riflemanship, good rifle craft, marksmanship, how to use your rifles and then it adds all of those extra bits that then make you confident when it goes out to a dynamic environment. So thank you very much to Andrew and Helena for making us feel so welcome and then giving us the tools that we need to take to move on. And then from there, we went to see our good friend Frederick van Drumme in Belgium at his shop. Yeah, which was really good. Which is like in a little in Aladdin's cave. Now, I've known Frederick for some time. He's a big fan of Team Wild. Seen him quite a few times at the Ewa show in Nuremberg. And a few years back, he came and showed me the plans of his shop. And I thought, wow, oh, that looks amazing. To actually see it in the flesh, that yeah, was pretty impressive. And for me personally, it's great to see how European hunters, they, they choose their equipment, what rifles they like, what scopes they like, the ammunition that they choose, and, and how a retail environment in Europe is, is set up. And it was, it was pretty cool. It was very cool. I couldn't believe the amount of brands and, and for such a little place he got in there. It was, like Ian said, in Aladdin's cave, he got mm. everything in there. And of course, Steve had to buy something, so he bought himself another Trigger magazine, magazine. for his Plaza R8. Yeah. He's like a little magpie. He can't walk away from a retail environment without buying something that is absolutely essential. It does burn a hole in my pocket, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but yes, as you say, you know, his Brownings, his Blazers, his Sours, the Mauser. Mm. There was just about every manner of rifle you could imagine in there. And that's the great thing about Europe. There's so many different game species to be able to hunt, and they do like their decorative rifles as well. Oh, there's so big, heavy embossed engraving. Lovely engraving, lovely wood, and a very traditional style of farm which I'm a big fan of. From there we went on to see the Blaza and Sour Factory at Isney so we got to have a look around at the showrooms there, look at some of their new models, look at some of the exciting additions to the range that are coming in the next few months including the silenced Blaza R8 Professional which yeah. you quite like the look of. I did like the look of that, the way that the silencer comes all the way down the barrel. It was yeah. unique, I haven't seen anything like it before and it'd be nice to get hands on it mm. eventually and see how it performs but no it was really good for me to go around the factory to see the start to the finish of making the rifles and the different stages and the machines that they were using to do it was really really good. When you say gun making you see little guys in Geppetto's workshop and they're filing things and hammering things yeah. and, and it all feels like craftsmanship. You go into the Blaza Sour Mauser factory in Isney and it is all state-of-the-art CNC technologically advanced equipment yeah. and it just goes to show how much goes into producing these precision instruments and they, they really are. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately we couldn't film at the factory this time because having a bit of a move around there's been a lot of expansion, there's new buildings been built all over the place uh, so we're going to go back a little bit later on during the year we're going to run the, through the factory from start to finish as part of our next trip in July I believe so stay tuned for that. So after we had a good look around the, the factory and had a look at the showrooms and the new 
new models. We then went on to the Shiskino, the shooting cinema, which is where Wildy elbows me out the way and he plays Space Invaders with wild pigs. And that, I have to say, was probably the most fun part of the entire trip. It was awesome. Bringing everything together, all of the equipment, the equipment choices we made, the ammunition, using different types of rifle, and then seeing the pig on the screen. For those that haven't seen it, it's basically a cinema where they play a series of wild boar scenarios running across in front of you. You shoot at the screen and it tells you where you've hit. Pauses the video and it can see if you've made a good shot or if you shot it in the haunches or missed it completely. And that really helped us pull everything together that we've been learning yeah. into an environment and a scenario which is almost identical to that you'd be experiencing in the field. And, and you seem to enjoy that. I loved it. I loved it. When you shot the wild boar target at Andrews, it was just straight line, backwards and forwards. When we were in the Shiskino, the pigs were moving uphill, downhill across different angles. Different speeds. So, yeah, different speeds, trotting and yeah, it was good. really, really good. And like Ian said, I did push him out of the way. Difficult to get him out of that room. I think if we'd left him there for a few hours, he'd have burnt a few barrels out. But that then, once again, the next stage in confidence. Yep, I know what I'm doing. I feel good. Give it a little bit more lead. And then when you think you should give it some more, just another couple of inches. And that was a good indication of where we should be shooting at yeah. certain distances. As Steve said, the running target, Andrew Van was good for just drilling in that movement, that rifle movement, that mount, that consistency when it comes to your shooting position but then you throw in the variables of pigs moving at different angles uphill downhill different speeds different sizes and that really then brings everything together yeah after that we then drove over to Hungary finished off our journey went out for an evening stalking well actually Steve was sitting uh, and yeah. I was stalking and I think we probably got put in the wrong places I've hunted in Hungary with Wonder Heart before on many occasions uh, and I've always had good trips. This time you didn't see anything when you went out in the evening? Apart from a cat? Apart from a cat. And I wasn't going to shoot Tiddles. And I don't think it was a Hungarian lynx. I, I no, think it was a no. domesticated cat, which is a bit of a shame. And then I went to an area, but they weren't the pigs that I was looking for. So I shot quite a few wild boar and I was looking for something in particular when I was going out stalking. Maybe a fallow doe that we could brought home and we could have harvested the meat. But as it happens, we're probably in the wrong place. So I saw a lot of game that wasn't really the sort of thing I wanted to shoot at that time. Steve didn't see anything. No. But you were all pretty chipper about it when we got back. Oh yeah, I was always. He's incredibly happy when he, doesn't, <laughs> when he goes out hunting and doesn't see animals. And then we had two driven days. Now I have to say, there was a last minute change to the venue. So in fairness to uh, Wonder Heart, they did the very best. There was a swine fever, an African swine fever outbreak in the yeah. north of Hungary at the venue that we were supposed to be hunting at. So it was a last minute change, but uh, he did our best for us. But when we got to the venue, there weren't as many animals as we were expecting. No, there wasn't, not at all. In fact, the first day's hunting, we never saw anything at all, did we? Mm. I think there was one boar shot and that was shot by one of the locals I don't think any of our hunting party did mm. see anything at all but it was a bit disappointing but like I say they did the best that they could for us in the time scale I think that they had yeah. so. I'd rather have a change of venue than a council trip to be yeah. honest and I know that Thomas takes his responsibilities to his clients very seriously and I'm sure that had he been able to make a different choice he, he probably would have done yeah. uh, but then on the second day a few more animals and I think we ended up with 20 in total in the tableau which is pretty good I think we had 97 shots in total so yeah, it wasn't quite what we were expecting, but I think at the end of the day, it finished off pretty well. We met some amazing people. A yeah, lot we of the did. other guys that we hunted with were pretty cool. And that's the great thing about these next days. You can pull people together from lots of different walks of life, lots of different locations, and yeah. then we all get together and have a bit of fun. Yeah, I mean, it was good for me. I know we were late in the season yeah. in February, that it's basically the last hunt that they were doing anyway on the driven board. But it was cool for me because there was a lot of keepers there, like myself, and because our season's finished over here with our driven birds, so it was good that they were there and all from similar mm. walks of life. So it was good for me. And we had a few um, palinkas which helped the evening yeah, pass on. Yeah, so. certainly. So palinka is a Hungarian liquor type of alcoholic drink, which it can grab hold of you and, and shake you around a bit if you're not used to it. A little bit like having whiskey when you go up on the Heinz in, in January. It's uh, The first few kind of help warm the spirits, and the second four or five, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, they, they can make it very difficult to get up the following morning. Uh, but a great, great team of guns, really cool people, and I hope at some point in time we get the opportunity yeah. to hunt with them again. So the trip, as I say, it was great from start to finish, lots of different experiences. What I will say, just on the driven side of things, we're all excited to watch Wild Boar Fever, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, whatever it is at the moment. They're great films, and they really do show an exciting type of wild boar hunting. But be realistic when you get to these venues. Unfortunately, these hunts are not always going to be that way. You're not going to see 40, 50 pigs running across in a drive. If you take a budget-driven wild boar hunt, you're not going to see that number of pigs. And the pigs that you do see, you've got to be ready to make those shots count. Exactly the same as shooting a 100-bird day. You're not going to be seeing the same sort of birds flown over at your wall 
Water Priory or one of the better halls at the States. And I think it's being realistic. Uh, of course, there were, and, and Thomas himself would be the first to say that there weren't as many animals they'd hoped to see. But, you know, just give yourself the opportunity of enjoying what's in front of you. And even if it's a little bit disappointing, making the best of the environment and the hunting opportunity. Those big bore days, you know, 10, 15,000 euros per gun per peg. So, unfortunately, not it's not always range. that, and it's not in our <laughs> price range either. So just be realistic when you're booking these trips. And remember that a cheap hunt is often an expensive walk in the bush. So pick something that's appropriate for your budget and be realistic when you get there as to what you're expecting to see. So down to the equipment. So we weren't entirely sure what the weather was going to be when we first went out there. So it was actually quite sunny. We were expecting snow. Well, and... we drove through all manner of yeah, we did. blizzards we had rain, and we had ice. sunshine. And then we had the most amazing winter snowstorm yeah. as we came through eastern Germany and into Austria. We did. And then we tipped out in Hungary and it was beautiful sunshine. It was quite mild. <laughs> yeah, it was. So we chose our deer hunter Mouflon winter outfit, which is one of my favourites. But as you can see, it's pretty hardcore stuff. This is not for sunbathing or being out in 15 degrees, which I think it was in Hungary. Now, this is a highly technical suit. It's got the talipets, the uh, the bib overalls. Great for keeping the core warm. That's for me, keeping my kidneys warm, my core it means the rest of my body stays warm. It's waterproof, breathable. It's also insulated. All manner of different pockets and storage options. Underneath that, exactly the same as you'd normally expect to see when I'm hunting. Greenock base layer, Dunbar insulating fleece. One of the padded, either the padded gilet or padded jacket, Cumberland Pro insulated gilet or jacket is what I tend to wear. The long version of the Mouflon jacket hangs quite low, mid thigh level. I have a short and a longer one. I use a shorter one for stalking and the longer one for when I'm sitting in a high seat. It does have flaps that two-way zip that allow you to sit down and the pockets to be able to sit flat onto the top of your thighs which is nice and comfortable. And really nice touches such as in this pocket it has the bullet slides, bullet holes so that you can quickly uh, take bullets out and you can reload. But it's all about once again layering up appropriately for the environment you're in. Now whilst this is still quite warm and insulated it has pit zips so underneath the arms you can unzip to allow more airflow through there. But the reality is if you you stood out there uh, in bright sunshine uh, you're going to get a bit warm in this gear and then as soon as you start walking to go back to the trucks things can get you know, pretty, yeah. pretty warm pretty quickly so it's an amazing outfit one that i'll definitely use for driven hunting again and i'm going to be using this also in our upcoming trip for muskox caribou arctic hare polar fox and ptarmigan in greenland there the temperatures will fluctuate between zero and minus 40 degrees celsius so this is the ideal suit for that along with the layering system that i normally use those you can see up here i've also got my high vis sour cap that's mainly a little bit of safety, make sure that my fellow guns know exactly where I am. The great thing about hunting in a place like Hungary on, on an organised trip is they'll tell you your arc of fire, they'll tell you exactly where your fellow guns are. Even if you can't see them, if they're over a ridge, they'll make sure that you know exactly where you can and can't shoot. But always wear a little bit of high vis to make sure that it's really obvious to everybody around you where you are. So great clothing, I think you, you enjoyed yours as well. Exactly, yeah. But like I say, it was a little bit warm. And the first day wasn't too bad, there was a bit of snow in the wind. Yeah. But the wind chill kept it down, but on the second day it was a bit sunny. But we didn't need to use the quilted jackets underneath the jacket no. just on top of your base layer and your dunbar was absolutely fine you didn't need anything else it kept you warm and toasty all day long yeah so, so as, as steve says typically we use wherever we are in the world whatever we're doing we typically use the same base layering system starting off with the greenock it's a man-made fiber so it wicks moisture very easily it's also got pile on the inside so it's nice and warm it holds a lot of air now on top of that we've got the dunbar fleece insulating layer it's nice thin fitted material and so it doesn't cause any unnecessary bulkiness but it keeps you nice and warm. On top of that, a padded insulated jacket, so the quilted jacket here, which is Cumberland, that's my preferred. You wear the Dunbar though, don't you? Yeah. Which is a very similar sort of cut, but different. And also with the Mouflon series, there's a zip-in fleece and a zip-in quilted option to give you the right choice depending on the conditions that you're in. But that's going to be pretty hardcore stuff, but once again, I might be using that I'm over in Greenland. I'm going to say that in Greenland, yeah. So the rest of the equipment is pretty straightforward. You shot your Blaza R8 Professional? Yeah, I did, as normal, my go-to rifle. I had a second magazine with it because when um, they were used shooting the Magnum calibers, it only holds three bullets into the magazine, which is part of the trigger mech, and one into the breech, so only four shots, and in shooting driven, you need really get um, your second magazine as quick as you can, so I've got a spare magazine, although I didn't really need it. And I got my Hawk Frontier 30 on top, one to six by 24, with its adjustable one-tenth MRAD turrets on the top there. It's got an illuminated reticle with six settings of bright which is really really good when I'm shooting driven. I like to have it turned up on the maximum setting because of the bright light you can pick it out quickly when speed's the name of the game when we're doing that and of course the R8 is straight pull which is one of the fastest cycling rifles on the market so all in all I love that setup and it's been brilliant for me. 
So obviously the Plaza R8 is a rifle which you've used quite extensively. Yeah. You used it over in Alaska, he's used it here for deer stalking at home, just puts the 308 barrel. Because the interchangeable nature, modular nature of the rifle also allows you to get used to using one rifle for all scenarios. That's correct. They use the same scope. All I've got for the different setups that I'm using. In my hard case, it's stuck on there. So I just click round from zero. The adjustment on the windage, adjustment on the elevation, and put that scope back onto that 308 barrel, and I'm good to go. And I'm quite confident without re-zeroing or anything, I can go straight into the field and use it. And then, like I say, back to 300 Win Mag, put my clicks back to the zero marks, which I leave my scope set at zero on 300 Win Mag and then adjust to the 308. So, no, it's perfect, and you've got ultimate confidence in it. So me, I was shooting my Sauer 404 Synchro XT in 338 Win Mag. It's the identical setup I used over in Alaska, so I'm pretty confident with its knockdown power. It's also a rifle I've become very comfortable shooting. I can adjust the height of the comb so that my eye falls directly behind the scope. So in terms of raising my gun and my mount, I just need to focus on the target in front of me. The gun comes straight up, my eye is looking directly behind the crosshair, and you can, as you say, focus on the animal, the illuminated dot in the center of the reticle of this Hawk Endurance 1 to 4 by 24 immediately comes into view and you can just shoot instinctively. Both of these scopes are 30 mil monotube construction, so they're really, really solid. Shockproof, waterproof, dustproof, just about anything proof. We had quite a lot of different weather over there, so they did get west and they did get bounced around in trucks and those sorts of things, and they seemed pretty robust. They held zero very, very well. Of course, your Hulk Frontier has got a longer eye relief from using Magnum Calibre, so it's got five centimeter eye relief, so yeah, less chance of getting punched in the face, as has happened to me quite a few times. A little bit smaller at four centimeters with the Hawk Endurance, but once again, didn't seem to find have that trouble. When you're shooting stood up or off sticks or driven, there's a little bit more space between your eyes, a little bit more give. When you're lying down on a bipod, that's when you tend to get scoped. Much in the same way as with Steve's R8, the Sauer 404 is a modular design, which means I can switch the 338 Win Mag barrel out, put in the 308 barrel, and I can put a scope on that's adjusted to it. A much easier system for me to swap out my magazine. And the Sauer magazine holds four in here, and then one in the tube, and I've got two magazines that can switch out. So it's a little bit less cumbersome, I'd say, than switching out the trigger mag, but once you get used to both systems, they both work really, really well. So the optics on the guns were good. When we were out stalking, once again, Hawk Endurance 12 by 56 binoculars. They did the job perfectly. You didn't see any game? No, didn't see any game, but um, we were looking way until the dark and in the low light, they performed as well as anything, really. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. Really. You know, I had quite a few people say to me, you know, are they really good? How do they compare to Swarovski's ice or whatever? They work for me if we kill animals. So. Consistently. You know, other than that, I don't really know what else to say in that you should just go into a store, pick a brand which suits you, have a look through them. When it comes to binoculars, it's not so much low light level. They've all got a very similar ability, I would say. For me, the most important thing is the strain that it has on your eyes. Can you look through them for long periods of time without giving you a headache, without losing the edge of the sight picture, that chromatic aberration? You know, do you have nice, crisp, clean image right the way to the outsides that you can sit and look for a long time? And if that's the case, then they certainly work for me. It, yeah. But all the scopes and all the optics have been provided by Hawk, well, check out the footage, check out the films, and you'll see the results for yourself. They perform incredibly well. They are that kind of entry to mid-level scope. If you do want something with a few more bells and whistles and you want to part with a few more pounds, you know, that's perfectly up to you. It's, you know, there's some great optics out there and some great choices. But for me, I'm about hunting, killing the animals humanely, and getting back and getting everything skinned out. So I don't need the bells and whistles. I need a good quality, high performance optic in the field that's going to deliver the service that we're looking for. So, ammunition-wise, this might seem a bit familiar to you, but Hornady Superformance SST, Steve's 300 Win Mags are in 180 grains, my 338 Win Mag are in 225 grains. Once again, shot them across in Alaska, hugely impressive knockdown performance. We know where they're going, the rifles are zeroed and set up specifically for yeah. the ammunition, so, so why change something that you know and trust? If it isn't broken, don't try and fix it. The rifle loves the Hornady, they go exactly where you put them and they do the job. You give them the old Hornady handshake and that's the end of that. Mm. Well, all barrels can be a little bit different. I'm not saying this is going to work in your rifle, depending on the rates of twist, depending on the material, whether you've got a moderator fitted, and everything can be slightly fussy. We just found that these have worked particularly well with us. And not only have they worked well through the rifles and given us that performance on the targets, when they get out into the field, they brought the animals down quickly, yep. cleanly and humanely. In addition to the rifles that we're very familiar with, we've also got our sticks. Now, we both come from completely different angles on this. My Vanguard B62s, they're about eight years old, hunted on five different continents, and they do what I ask them to do. Nice and simple, I tend to just put my binos on them when I'm blasting. I know that this fitting on the top here will fit any rifle that I put into it. They're aluminium construction, which means that they've got that good sturdy left and right from kind of going through rivers and all that sort of thing. And to be honest, I'm a bit sentimentally attached to them. What's amazing repair taping system on them, which is electric 
electrician's tape, which seems to hold them together. I don't know why, they're 60 quid, I should have just bought a new pair, but they do exactly the job I need them to do. And when we're out hunting for wild boar, even though sometimes you're in a tower and you've got that little bit of support around you, sometimes you're out in the middle of a field and having the rifle set up in the angle to which you're gonna shoot your arc of fire in front of you, and the ability to be able to just maneuver yourself on the sticks, particularly with this rotating head at the top, very, very handy. Even if you were just gonna keep your rifle there, lift it off, push the sticks forward, and then take a shot freehand, which I did on the 180 yard fallow deer that you saw. These are a great solution for me. But you have gone for a slightly more sophisticated and modern version of that. Yeah, my sticks are from Spartan Precision Equipment. They do two different types of um, this stick. They do the woodland version, which is longer, which I use, which these are, they extend out so I can be so high. I don't need any electrical tape because these are made of carbon fibre, they're very strong and they all stay together and, and support my great weight and I go mm. through streams and everything else as well. And they're very light, they weigh in at just shy of 980 grams, so for a set of sticks that's really, really light. They fit by the magnet connection as all Spartan bipods do, fit straight into my stock with that hole there and locate and I love them, as you know, I love them. Take them everywhere, all over the world with me, they're the first thing that go in my bag. So. That's my sticks. Yeah, I call them Wildy's gimmick sticks because he likes to have different things. And Yeah, you know, that, I can't afford electrical tape like he is, yeah, so no. I just stay with carbon fibre. So one day when, when Wildy does fall over and break his sticks, he'll be coming to me and asking for electrical tape. But in the meantime, they look pretty strong. And when we're over in Alaska, we hung our rifles on them, binos and all of our clothes to dry. So they've got that really good rigidity. And as he says, you know, you can take off one pole and you can use it as a trekking pole um, if you need to give yourself that little bit extra support. So you get on very well with those. So slightly different approach to it. There's no right and wrong answer. It's just a matter of picking something that works for you and a system which you get used to. I have had a look at these. I'm yet to be convinced, maybe because I'm still a little sentimentally attached to these, but you know, we'll, we'll see how we get on. So only one of the bit of equipment that I use, Steve didn't use this, is my Vaughan Lynx backpack. I'm starting to get used to having that additional storage when I go out stalking, so I like having a backpack with me. I'm also really enjoying the ability to be able to have that rifle out the way so I can use my sticks, I can glass, I can manoeuvre myself around. If I'm on slippy terrain, I don't have the rifle coming under my sling. Maybe a bit of a luxury, but the Vaughan Lynx backpack has a quick release rifle system that allows you to put it into the pack, walk around with it, and it's as quick to get the rifle off onto your sticks it is using a sling. Not only that, you can take your sandwiches, extra waterproofs and insulating layer, spare ammunition, well, just about everything you need for a day's hunting. So I'm starting to get used to the system and now I've got used to it. I don't think I want to go back, but yeah, it's, it's slightly different because we all have our own way of shooting, but that for me has been a pack that I've really enjoyed using and one that I can certainly see myself using more regularly in the future. So. The last bit of equipment I'd like to run through is this, it's our Jetboil Sumo. Now, it might seem a bit of a strange thing to have on the end of the table there when you've got all of the other paraphernalia in front of you, but actually, after you finish the day in the field and you're cold and you're wet and you're miserable or bored, as you might be if you've not seen anything, <laughs> And there's nothing that warms the spirit like a cup of joe and sitting down. Well, that's right. And we were, we were there because we drove over, we got the vehicle and we were on the tailgate. We got the jet boil going. Everybody else was sort of standing around thinking what's happening next. And we had a brew and it was awesome. So yeah, it's becoming one of the things that we put in the vehicle, make sure it's there yep. with a bottle of water and you can't go wrong. So Steve puts it, the first thing that go in his bag is his gimmick sticks, first thing that goes in my bag is a Sumo over there. And it's actually Mark McGuinness that introduces to this when we were out hunting in Alaska. Yeah. And I'd imagine that that's the only bit of equipment that we need if we're going away somewhere hunting. Freeze dries food, bottle of water, Sumo jet boil, and a cheeky smile. So there we have it. So that's the equipment that we've used. Other than that, we've had a great trip. It's been exciting. We've met some amazing people. We've learned some new skills. Yeah. You've learned patience. A lot. Yeah. They're not only, you're not going to see all the animals you want to see all the time. Just in case you haven't seen one, here's a Hungarian wild boar. Here's what they look like in the flesh. Now, Steve won't have seen one of these when we're away on our trip. No. Yeah, this is one I took out with Thomas a few years back. So they are out there somewhere, and hopefully we're going to go back wild boar hunting again with Thomas in November, December, and January and we'll bring that video series to you probably the early part of next year. So all I have to say is thank you very much for following. I hope you've enjoyed the journey and here's some of the best Brits from our epic wild boar hunting trip to Hungary. Possible to be. <laughs>
for our upcoming wild boar hunt in Hungary. We're here in Wales at WMS Firearms Training. We're here in Belgium at Jagdhaus van Drommen. We're at the Sauer Factory in Isny. So it's a beautiful sunny afternoon uh, here in early February in Hungary and we're out stalking. So it's a beautiful morning here in Hungary. We're out on peg. I, I drew peg 20 this morning so I'm kind of at the end of the line. So it's another beautiful morning here in Hungary. It's day two of our driven hunt. Whenever Perfect. you're ready, Steve. Shall I get rid of that? What's that, mate? Okay. I don't know. Let's get rid of the sign. He's shooting my Sauer 404 in 338 Wind Mag, uh, fitted with a Hawk Endurance 31 to 4 by 24. And I'll be using my Blazer R8 Professional in 300 Wind Mag, fitted with a Hawk. <laughs> fitted with a <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to do this to you, Steve. Yeah, right. Nemesis Roebuck, middle row, right hand side. Oh! <laughs> Good job. And again, same animal. Oh, damn, I was hoping you hadn't noticed. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> I, was, I, I was hoping you hadn't noticed because I wanted one of them. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I could do one if you want. <laughs> There's a big truck about to come past. So, right, if you just get ready by the time you. It's a tractor, right? What's the betting it's coming in here? It's just going to ram us into the field. <laughs> Uh, we've had a look at the Blazer Custom Shop as well, so Wildy's next upcoming rifle is in there too. Yeah, well, no, not in the Blazer. Yeah, it was. That was rubbish, sorry. Uh, different styles, variants, models, calibres, stock options from Sauer. We've also been in the Blazer, Pl Blazer Shop as well, which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Looked so at their new models. OK, so we've arrived. We've done just done stop. And on top, I've got my Hawk, one to six times 24, scope. I'll say that again. On top, I've got my Endurance 30. I'll say that again. So today I'm shooting my Sauer 404 Synchro XT. Um, it's got a... Uh, <coughs> So today I'm shooting my Sauer 404 Synchro XT. I've got it on six today because it is quite dull and gloomy and it picks out the picks out the skyline really well. So that's good. Um, which we Stephen. You're doing all right. Well, no, I'm crap. It's got a laser edged. No, it hasn't. <coughs> and I can't shut this. Awful love in the morning. Uh, so you can take everything you need to your peg. You don't need to take a rucksack. <coughs> Excuse me. You don't need to need. <sighs> you don't need to take a rucksack if you don't. Come on, rucksack. You don't need to take a rucksack. You can get everything into your pockets. Why don't you go in? I think it's like there we go. We've got it there. Cool. I always take my sticks because even if we're sat in a high seat. They can be used. No, shut up, Stephen. You. I've been going fine after then, haven't I? Waiting for one to separate. Should have had a shot at one of them. I'm sure he said we could shoot fella. Oh, that's a big Kyler. That was a big Kyler. Ball coming, ball coming, ball coming. Gonna come out here. Oh, I missed, I don't believe that. So, that looks about it for today. Well, the trip really. Um, or not. Okay, so that looks like it's it for today. Um, and the trip really. We pig gods definitely haven't been with us today. Well, they haven't been with us all week. Drop that. Right, we'll do that again, mate. And there's always tomorrow. Tomorrow and hope springs eternal, young man. <laughs> Cheers. Hope springs eternal. That is amazing. You're like a philosopher for that. <laughs> You ready? Oh, 
して。So welcome to the final instalment of our epic wild boar hunting trip to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> wild boar hunting trip. It wasn't, it wasn't at all. Hello, yeah. hello Christmas, here we later. come. <laughs> oh, these are very nice rifles. Wild boar hunting trip to Alaska, we have to organise those. <laughs>